Hi everyone and welcome to another crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of George Smith and the murder of Mary Ann Swan which took place in Bedlington at Hurst Head Farm in 1906. But before we begin, can I just say if you do enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here or haven't already done so then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. I would also like to add that I took the location photos on a day that was meant to be sunny and dry and then it turned into a day that was wet and dull. So I am sorry if some of the photos are a little dark or have raindrops on them. There is very little information about the earlier life of George Smith. In fact, most papers covering the story at the time did not even mention his age with the closest being a suggestion that he was between 37 and 40 years old. The name Smith also makes it quite difficult to search, as it is quite a common name, so many options do appear, but few, or in this case none, are actually correct. At best we know he was a minor and was married to a lady possibly by the name of Jenny, and had three young children, and lived at Cowpen Quay in Blythe. He had also previously spent time in an asylum. Mary Ann Swan, the victim, had been born in Bedlington in around 1834 to parents Robert and Mary Ann, and she was one of at least nine children. At the time of her death, she was said to be around 72 years old. She had never married and lived alone in the old farmhouse at Hurst Head Farm in Bedlington. Mary had previously lived with her brother Robert until he died and when a new larger farmhouse was built she was given at the old farmhouse to live in on her own. Although 72 years old Mary Ann was still quite an active lady and each morning she would head up to the main farmhouse. Oddly on August 26th she did not do this and John Swan her nephew who had taken over the running of the farm after the death of Robert had been worried about her, so at around 11.30am he went down to the old farmhouse to look for her. On getting no answer at the door, he had used a ladder with the help of the farm steward to climb into an upstairs window, which was closed but not locked. Once inside, he discovered the bedroom to be in a state of disarray. The bedclothes were on the floor and appeared to be stained with blood, but there was no sign of his aunt so he made his way downstairs. And it was here that he found Mary Ann lying on the kitchen floor next to the fire in a pool of blood. He quickly realised that she was dead and had been so for some time. She was dressed in her night dress and had bare feet. Her throat had been cut and a razor was on the floor next to her body. John immediately sent for the doctor and the police. Dr. Morris arrived a short time later and on examining the body of Mary Ann, he estimated that she had been dead for several hours. Apart from her throat being cut, he also believed it was possible that she had been abused. Sergeant Metcalf of Bedlington Police Station was next to arrive. He also notified Superintendent Tuff of Blythe Police St Station who arrived at the farmhouse at around 3pm. They both examined the house and found the rooms to be ransacked, with drawers pulled out and various items lying round the floors. Also on the floor they found footprints in blood, but these were not boot prints, but prints from someone who was only wearing socks. On making inquiries in the area, they were told by several different people of a man who had been near the farmhouse the previous night and had also been around several other places close to the farm, and most people had stated that the man had seemed to be acting very strangely, and some had named him as being George Smith from Blythe. Acting on this information, Sergeant Metcalf went to his home and arrested George on suspicion of the murder of Mary Ann Swan. He then took him to Bedlington Police Station. Sergeant Metcalf returned to the home of George Smith and on searching it he found several items of clothing that were bloodstained. And when he went back to the police station he asked George to remove his boots and socks and he noted that his feet were also bloodstained. 
George would later be charged with the willful murder of Mary Ann Swan. Prior to the inquest, George Smith had been formally charged at a special court hearing at Bedlington Magistrates' Courts. The details of this court hearing and those who gave evidence were the same as at the inquest. The inquest was initially opened at Bedlington Police Court on August 28th. George Smith was not present for this. John Swan identified the body as being that of his aunt Mary Ann Swan, who was 72 years old and a spinster, living alone at Hurst Head Farm. The coroner then stated that the inquest would be adjourned to allow the police to gather all of their evidence for this very difficult case, and they would resume the inquest in September. The funeral of Mary Ann took place on August 29th, 1906, at what was described at the time as the Old Churchyard, and this was, of course, St Cuthbert's Church in Bedlington. It was said that she was very well known and respected in the area, and huge crowds had gathered at her home and on the roads leading to the church to pay their respects. The crowds had almost blocked the roads leading down from Vulcan Place. It was said that the hearse was covered with floral tributes and at the church the workers of Hurst Head Farm had carried the coffin inside. The service was conducted by the Reverend Canon Usher assisted by the Reverend Mr Taylor. Many of the family were in attendance including John and William Swan, Robert Swan, Joseph Swan and many others. The photo that you can see on screen now shows the final resting place of Mary Ann Swan. She was buried in the family grave with her parents, Robert and Mary. As is often the case when covering these stories, it always feels quite emotional when you are standing at the graveside of the murder victim. The inquest resumed at Bedlington Police Courts at the end of September. George Smith, again, was not present at the inquest, though no reason was given. John Swan stated that he had gone to the home of his aunt on the morning of August 26th when she had not made her usual visit to his home. He said he had found his aunt in the kitchen lying in a pool of blood. She had a large wound to her neck and it had been clear to him that she was already dead. He had sent for Dr Morris and the police. Mary Ellen Brown said she was employed as a domestic by John Swan. She had been the last to see Mary Ann alive on the night of August the 25th. She said she had been about to retire for the night when she spoke to her at around 11.30pm. Sarah Hay said she lived at Hearst Terrace and on the night of August the 25th she had seen a man at the entrance to the farm. She said she had not seen him until she got close to the gates, but when she did, she had turned and walked back in the direction that she had come from. But he had shouted at her, Come here, miss, and ran after her for a few yards. She told him if he did not go away, she would tell the police. He then shook his fists at her, swore, and said he would murder her. He then called out, Come on, Mary Ann, or Mary Lizzie. She could not be sure which name he had shouted. Sarah said she had continued walking quickly away from him and on the same road she came up to a man by the name of Joseph Gillespie. The man was just behind her and on seeing Joseph, George had attempted to hit him. Sarah had since identified the man as being George Smith and believed that George was under the influence of drink on the night in question. John Joseph Gillespie said he had been standing in the road near to Hurst Head Farm when Sarah had ran up to him. George, who had been behind Sarah, tried to hit him. He had struck out at George and he had fallen to the ground. He said he had hit George again when he was on the ground and he did not get up immediately and Joseph said he had not waited around to see if he was okay. Sarah had run away when he had begun fighting with George. He believed that George was very drunk at the time. Cuthbert White stated that he kept a refreshment shop in Vulcan Place. He claimed that George had entered his shop between 10.45 and 11pm. He had asked for some pie and peas, and he had then asked for a second pie, telling Cuthbert, I am broke, but I will come back tomorrow and pay for it, telling him that his name was George Smith of Blythe and that everyone knew him. 
Cuthbert said he went to place the pie in the outside pocket of George's coat, but he told him not to put it there as he had a razor in that pocket. George had then shown him the razor. When asked, he said he could not be sure that the razor produced at the inquest was the same as the one that George had shown him. Thomas Hempstead of Millbank Crescent said he found George Smith in his backyard at around 11.30pm on the night of the murder. He said he knew the man well and asked him what he was doing in his yard. George attempted to hit him and had said the, and he said the pair had fought for a few moments, with George trying to kick and bite him. He was able to open the back gate and George ran off shouting, I am George Smith and I don't care for anyone. When asked, he said he believed he had hit George in the face once or twice, but did not know if he had been badly hurt. He also felt George had been very drunk at the time. Christina Binks said at around 11.30pm on the night of the murder, she had gone outside and left her door open, and on her return had heard a noise and found a man in her kitchen. She had ran to find her husband, and on their return the man had gone. She said she had been to Blythe Police Station and had identified the man as being George Smith. George Crawford said George Smith was his brother-in-law. He said he had been with George earlier on the night of the murder. They had gone to the Black Bull at Bedlington where they had had a drink together. Later they had gone to the Turk's Head and then on to the Mason's Arms. He said George had been in a strange mood and by the time they reached the final pub they had argued and George had grabbed him by the collar but he had let him go and he said he had left after this incident and did not see George any more that night. Mary Plant said she had been staying at the home of George Smith and his wife in Calpin on the night of the murder. She had been awoken by George knocking at the door at around 4.30am. His wife had let him in and returned to bed. In the morning, she said George was up around 9.30am, claiming that he could not sleep. She said he was dressed in different clothes to the ones he had been wearing the night before, and she had seen him trying to clean some of his clothing from the day before, and had noticed the water in the pail where he had tried to wash his trousers looked a red colour to her. She also noticed him wiping something from his feet, and thought that he had blood on his feet, and he also had a black eye on the Sunday, which he had not had the night before. Acton Sergeant Lordman said he had visited the house at Hurst Farm and had taken some photos which he then passed to the jury. These included pictures of the house and also the razor found near to the body of Mary Ann, and also of the bloody footprints that had been on the floor. He also described having found a wash basin in the house with water in it that appeared red, and a soap that seemed to be smeared with blood. He found a gold watch and a gold brooch and four pound in coins in a lady's purse. He also found two empty purses on the floor. Sergeant Metcalf said he had found the body of Mary Ann lying in a pool of blood near to the fireplace. He could see that her throat had been cut. The room showed signs of a struggle as various items from the table were lying on the floor around her body. He also found a razor close to where she was lying. The floor was covered in blood and it appeared to him that someone wearing just socks had been walking in the blood and leaving footprints in various places. He found drawers and cupboard doors open as if somebody had been searching inside them and he noticed that the bedclothes upstairs were also stained with blood. There was a broken window at the back of the house, and he believed that the hole was large enough for a man to have climbed inside. The front and back doors had still been locked when John Swan had first called looking for his aunt, and it seemed to Sergeant Metcalf that the culprit had climbed back out of the same broken window. Acting on evidence received, he said he had gone to the home of George Smith and arrested him for the willful murder of Mary Ann. He said George had replied by saying, "'And I knout about it, lad.'" Sergeant Tuff said he had examined the bloodstained footprints and had taken measurements of them before having some of the floorboards in the house taken out. The footprints seemed to show a very unusual pattern, and he believed the socks worn by the murderer should be easy to identify. 
He went on to say that the pattern of the socks worn by George Smith had matched perfectly with the footprints found in the house. Dr Manners, a police surgeon at Blythe, said he had performed had performed the post-mortem on the body of Mary Ann. He had found some bruising and cuts to her face and head, but no sign of a fracture to the skull. She had a severe cut to her throat, some five inches long, which was very deep. It was his opinion that the cause of death had been a blood loss due to the wound in her throat. He was unsure as to whether or not she had also been abused, as there were wounds to the lower part of her body, but his examination had not proved conclusive. The jury at the inquest retired for 20 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder against George Smith and he would be committed for trial. The trial took place on November the 21st, 1906 at the Moot Hall in Newcastle. It was said that although the courtroom was filled to capacity, those who were there were mostly witnesses or family members. George Smith pleaded not guilty to the charge of the willful murder of Mary Ann Swan. Mary Ellen Brown, Sarah Hay, James Gillespie, Thomas Hempstead, Cuthbert White, Christina Binks, Dr Manners and Superintendent Tuff all gave the same evidence as that at the inquest. Robert Richardson said he worked at the, as a farm steward at Hursthead Farm. He had accompanied John Swan on the fateful morning when the body of Mary Ann had been discovered. He stated that she was known to get up around 9.30am and when she had not visited the main farmhouse by 11, John had become worried that something was wrong. He described entering the house by means of a ladder at an open window and explained that once inside they found the house to be in great disorder with drawers and cupboards open as if someone had been searching inside them. John Swan gave very similar evidence to that at the inquest, only adding that he had known George Smith for many years but had not seen him for some time. He had been aware that he had spent time in an asylum and believed that during this time his aunt had been very kind to his wife and children. He was asked that if he were to assume George was guilty of the crime, could he think of any motive for the murder, and he said he could not. He said he was not aware of his aunt having any quarrel with anyone recently. He believed she was very well liked and respected in the area and he also did not believe that anything had been stolen from the house. William Smith, a hairdresser, said that George was his brother. He said that on the afternoon of the murder, George had been to his shop. He had wished to collect a razor that had been repaired. He felt that George was behaving strangely. He had asked him to go for a drink with him. William said he had reminded George that he should not drink as it was not good for him, but George had told him that drink did him good. William said he told him he would be better to go home to his wife. After this, he said, George sat for a few moments before leaving the shop, bidding him farewell. He had been perfectly sober when he had been in this shop, but William said he saw him some 30 minutes later coming out of a public house close by and felt that he did not look right in himself. He stated that George sometimes acted strangely. He did not always seem, in his opinion, to be sane. George Crawford gave slightly more detailed evidence than he had done at the inquest. He stated that he had been in the Black Bull with George Smith at around 6pm on August the 25th. George had already been there when he arrived. They had a drink together and to him at this point everything seemed fine. A short time later they went into the Turk's Head public house. They were still on friendly terms and enjoyed another drink or two together. He said the only thing that changed was that George Smith was not quite so keen to pay his turn with the drinks here. He sometimes claimed to have no money. The final public house that they went into was the Mason's Arms, and it was here that the manager refused to serve George Smith with any more drink and asked George Crawford to take him outside, which he said he had done. Once outside of the Mason's Arms, he tried to persuade George to return with him to his mother's house, but he said George wanted more drink. 
At this point, he seemed to be acting in a wild manner, as if looking for a fight, and it was then that he grabbed him by the collar. However, he quickly let go, and George Crawford said he left him there just after 9pm. When asked, he stated that he had not known until recently that George Smith had previously been in an asylum, and that drink was dangerous to him. He had sometimes thought George acted in a strange manner, but he thought that this was just the way he was and did not think him to be insane. Richard Walker said he had seen a man fit in the description of George Smith near the entrance to Hurst Head Farm on the night of the murder at around 1am. He said the man did not appear to be insane, but did seem to be lost or confused. However, he could not positively identify George as being the man he had seen, but he felt that the height of the man, around five foot seven, was very much the same as the prisoner. Richard Nicholson said he had seen a man of the same description on the road to Blythe between 3 and 3.30 a.m. on August 26th. He was also unable to confirm that this man was George Smith. Mary Plant gave very similar evidence to that at the inquest, only adding that after washing and drying some of his clothing, George had placed them in a box and put something on top of it as if he was trying to hide them. Sergeant Metcalf spoke of the strange rambling statements made by George Smith when he had first charged him with the murder. He said he had said, Me? Murder a woman? As if in shock at the idea. He then stated that he had been fighting in Bedlington and the previous night and that he had walked into a tree on his way home, which had caused his black eye. Sergeant Metcalf said that some of his comments did not make sense at all, but he had ended by saying, I went to Bedlington to see me mother. I have not murdered anyone. You are a strange one and you have the wrong one this time. I had been to see me mother. I have not murdered anyone. Sergeant Lordman gave the same evidence as he had done at the inquest and once again he provided the photos for the jury to examine. Photography at evidence in crimes in was still quite a new thing and, as in this case, they would often include photos of the body of the person who had been murdered. Dr Morris again described the wounds inflicted on Mary Ann Swan. He estimated her time of death to have been some 10 or 11 hours before he had been called to the house, which had been at midday. When asked, he stated that a person who suffered with homicidal mania due to the drink could relapse if he was to drink again. He also said that although he had no experience of it, a man suffering such an attack may not be able to remember anything that he had done. Richard Hutchinson said he worked for Mr Asquith, a hosier at Blythe, and had over 20 years experience. He had been asked by the police to examine the socks worn by George Smith. He had never before seen a pair of socks that had been made the same way as those belonging to the prisoner. They appeared to him to have been knitted by a novice. The feet were more suited to a child and the leg parts for a man. So if a man was to wear them, part of the leg would be under the heel, thus producing the exact pattern as the footprints in blood that had been shown as part of the evidence against George. There was no doubt in his mind that those footprints were made by those socks. Dr. McDowell said he was the medical superintendent of the Morpeth County Asylum. He stated that George Smith had been a patient there from June 1901 until he was discharged in February of 1904 as cured. On his arrival, he had been suffering from a very severe attack of insanity and several times had tried to attack the nurses looking after him. He had homicidal tendencies, but Dr. McDowell said he believed that anyone who suffered in this way could recover, but they would likely relapse if they were to drink again. In his opinion, the evidence he had heard suggested that due to his drinking, George had been suffering from insanity on the night of the murder, and if a man was suffering from such an attack, he would most likely be unable to remember anything that he had done. Dr. McDowell went on to say that he had examined George recently and believed him to be sane now. When asked, he stated that he felt George had been completely cured when he was discharged from the asylum in 1904. 
Dr Bramwell said he was the police surgeon at Tynemouth and had a lot of experience with cases of insanity. He had examined George Smith at Bly's police station recently and was of the opinion that he was a sane man. He completely agreed with the testimony of Dr McDowell that on the night of the murder, George was insane. John Atkinson of Millbank Terrace said on the night of August the 25th he had heard a noise in his backyard sometime between 11pm and midnight and he had found George Smith sitting in the wash tub. He was staring at him like a wild man. He knew it was George as he had known him for around 10 years. He asked him what he was doing and then asked him to leave. George climbed out of the tub and walked backwards out of the yard. He was not wearing his jacket and his braces were hanging down. He said he had spoken to George many times since he left the asylum and at times he felt his behaviour to be very strange with random rambling conversations. He stated that his behaviour could be quite odd even when he was sober. The defence stated that as George was unable to recall any of the events of the night of the murder, he would not be called to give evidence. He felt the evidence was circumstantial, but however, if the evidence was enough to convince the jury that George was indeed guilty of the murder of Mary Ann Swan, then they had to also consider the proof of his insanity. His previous history and the testimony of several witnesses as to his behaviour that night all pointed towards insanity. During his time spent in Morpeth Asylum, he had shown all the signs of homicidal, homicidal mania, signs that would have led him to commit a crime such as this. And the defence went on to say it was for the jury to decide if he had been aware that what he was doing when he had entered the home of Mary Ann Swan on the night of the 25th of August was something that he had been aware of. The prosecution stated that, in his opinion, there was evidence of drunkenness and violence, but he did not feel there was evidence of insanity. The judge, in summing up to the jury, said the question of whether or not George had committed the crime was not a difficult one. They must be aware that a man who wore the socks that left the distinctive impression inside the house was the same man who had been inside the house. But as to his state of mind at the time, it was for the jury to decide if he had known what he was doing was wrong. Even though his condition may be caused by the drink, if this made him temporarily insane, this would mean he may not know the difference between right and wrong, and the jury would still be justified in finding him guilty but insane. The jury retired for 20 minutes before returning to state that they found George Smith guilty of the murder of Mary Ann Swan, but that he had been insane at the time and not responsible for his actions. The judge then stated that George Smith would be detained as a lunatic in a criminal lunatic asylum for life. George listened to the verdict and sentence in silence and was then removed from, from the dock. I was unable to find any details of which asylum George was sent to, but it would be unlikely to be anywhere local to where he lived. I was also unable to find any information about what happened to George's wife and children after his sentence. This was a very sad and tragic story. It seems that George had not been truly cured. As if we are to believe those who spoke of him acting strangely even when sober, it would seem that his so-called insanity was not entirely caused by drinking and he perhaps should have had more treatment. Had this been the case, then he may not have been drinking on the night of the murder and he may not have broken into the home of Mary Ann and she herself would not have died in what can only be described as a senseless, motiveless murder. Similar to last week's story of the Seg Hill murder, I do believe the verdict was the correct one. I don't believe George had the slightest idea what he was doing that night. But it is a difficult one, as the crime he committed was a cruel one, and Mary Ann Swan certainly did not deserve to die. But what do you think? Was the verdict the correct one, or do you think George Smith should have been hanged? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. 
I do hope that you have found this very sad and tragic story interesting and I do apologise for the mistakes that I have made. I hope I have corrected them. As I have said many times before, this is a live recording. I do not edit anything. So I do sometimes make mistakes, especially in long stories such as this one. But I do thank you all very much for watching and I hope to see you all again very soon.